Alex, yep. you can set up yours. Mm -hmm. We are and rolling. We are rolling. All right. So, Anne, if you want to start sharing the first screen, we can uh, get um, moving forward. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Hi, I'm Ann Jones, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about Fly Girls. It was curiosity that brought me to Washington, D.C. in March of 2010. Well, actually, it was curiosity mixed with pride and family duty. My Aunt Carol was posthumously being awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. She had been one of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, of, or the WASP, of World War II. Finally, after more than six decades, Congress was recognizing the WASP for their extraordinary service during the war. My dad was unable to make the trip, so he asked me if I would like to represent Aunt Carol at the ceremony. I jumped at the chance. This was such a unique opportunity. I just had to go. My aunt, Carol Woodbury Jones Stortz, was born in Billings, Montana in 1918. She was the older child of Edith Woodbury and Robert Newton Jones. She had dark curly hair, was tall and thin. Hey, Anne? Dad, yeah. You want to share the screen? You want to share a screen? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it wasn't sure. shared. I apologize. Is it shared it now? Great to see a visual lover. Not yet. I thought I had shared it. I didn't realize I hadn't. Oh, here we go. Can you see her? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Okay. Because dad was six years younger, they were not particularly close. Aunt Carol would tell me stories about dad's annoyingly mischievous behavior as her little brother and how he was the favored child of their mother. Dad would tell me that Aunt Carol liked to ride horses, shoot rifles, and tinker under the hood of the car. When we went to Billings to visit grandmother, there on a bureau in her living room was this picture of Aunt Carol wearing her wasp uniform. I used to stare at that picture. Aunt Carol was so young and pretty in the picture, and she really didn't look the way I knew her. As a child, I was somewhat afraid of Aunt Carol. She was quiet, and, um, and when she did speak, she was a bit sarcastic and very direct. In time, I learned that she was actually very shy. Since her home was near San Diego, Aunt Carol was this enigmatic relative, someone I rarely saw and barely knew. Later, as an adult, when I lived out west, I got to know her a little better. She would drive her Mustang convertible very fast, with her short, curly, graying hair flying in the wind and her eyes shaded behind these aviator sunglasses. She had this slight scar down her face. Dad told me that she obtained that scar sometime after the war, but before I was born. Apparently, while on her honeymoon, she was in a horrific car accident. It was an accident that nearly killed her and did kill her new husband. It was also the accident that ended her flying career. I was sad that she was unable to attend this Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony. She had just died the year before, in 2009, in the haze of Alzheimer's. It was curiosity that had originally led my aunt into the world of flying. She had seen Lindbergh fly over Billings after his transatlantic flight in 1927, and also saw him in his Ford Trimotor when he toured the country. She had a fascination with flying, but never thought about learning how to fly until she received a letter from a friend. Her friend had written her that she had learned to fly at the University of Montana. With that, Ann Carroll decided that she too would learn to fly. In the winter of 1941, as she was finishing her last year at the University of Wisconsin, she applied and was accepted by the CPT program at UW. The CPT, or the Civilian Pilot Training Program, was a U.S. government-sponsored flight training program that was active between 1938 and 1944. As it became clear that the German Luftwaffe was already superior to our Army Air Force and was increasing in strength, the Roosevelt administration was furiously trying to build up the number of civilian pilots with the intention of military preparedness. They began setting up these CPT programs at college campuses around the country. In order for a program to operate, there needed to be a minimum class size of 20. For every 20 students, at least 18 were required to be white men. Anything over that number could be minorities or women. Since WASP and some of the WASP and Tuskegee Airmen learned to fly this way, Aunt Carol was one of them. 
After graduating from college, my aunt was working as a lab technician in Santa Barbara during the summer of 1942. She read an article in Time Magazine about this new Army Air Force program for women pilots, was intrigued and wrote the magazine to see if she could get an address. She was told that the director of the program, the famous aviatrix Jacqueline Cochran, was conducting interviews at a hotel in Los Angeles. Somehow, Aunt Carol got herself to the hotel and met with Jackie. Jackie told her that she needed more flight miles. Because private flying had been banned on the West Coast due to security concerns, Aunt Carol left California and returned to Montana to build up her flight log. Eventually, she made her way to Sweetwater, Texas to join other women at the WASP training program. It was there that she was given the nickname Suds, it came from her middle name, Woodbury. Perhaps you remember Woodbury Soap. Whenever she was called Suds, I knew she was with a WASP friend. During 1943 and 44, she served as a WASP at Camp Davis in North Carolina, Camp Stewart in Georgia, and Bigsfield in El Paso, Texas. After this WASP experience, she was bit at odds. She spent the next few years all over the U.S. working around airplanes in various capacities. Eventually, she worked in Forsyth, Montana as a private pilot. It was there that she met Bailey Stortz, a man who had wanted to hire her as a private pilot to fly him somewhere. She began dating him and then eventually married him. After her brief marriage and subsequent accident, Aunt Carol had to create a life for herself that ruled out her love of flying. She moved to post-war Germany and taught at an American military base. She eventually returned to the States, settled permanently in California, and became a high school math teacher. Through the years, she traveled a lot and saw much of the world. She never remarried, but always had a dog, drove her cars fast, and remained devotedly connected to her wasp friends. And Carol was a wasp. And while that experience was simply a brief moment in her 91-year-old life, it defined who she was to her very core. Even my first memorable description about Aunt Carol was my dad saying she was a wasp. She moved to Southern California so she could live near her wasp friends. And while she somewhat tried to build connections to her brother's family, these wasp friends were more family to her than we ever were. Today, when I ask people, do you know what a wasp is? I usually get an answer that either references yellow jackets or relates to the descendants of the Mayflower. This is not surprising. From the moment of their disbandment in 1944, the WASP records were sealed and marked, classified and secret, and they were stored in the archives for over 30 years. Historians had no access to the records or accomplishments of the WASP, so their story was systemically omitted from the most, officials, most official histories of World War II. As a nation, we all seem to know about Rosie the Riveter, but what about Cornelia Fort or Nancy Love? So for those of you who don't know, let me tell you something about these extraordinary women and their war service. In September 1940, Jackie Cochran wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, suggesting the establishment of a woman's flying division of the Army Air Force. Mrs. Roosevelt connected Jackie to the head of the Army Air Force, General Henry Arnold, better known as Hap Arnold. Not surprisingly, General Arnold rejected the idea. There was tremendous resistance to women serving in the military in any capacity. While they could be nurses and with some persuasion they could be cooks and office personnel, but actually flying military aircraft, no way. With America's entry into the war, the situation changed and attitudes did as well. Mrs. Roosevelt, always the advocate for women's rights, even wrote about women serving in the Army Air Force on September 1st, 1942 in her column, My Day. She wrote, we are in a war and we need to fight it with all our ability and every weapon possible. Women pilots in this particular case are a weapon waiting to be used. By 1942, the US Army Air Force was in critical need of pilots for the two front war that was underway. Not only pilots for combat, but they also needed pilots to fly the planes from the factories to the points of embarkation on each coast. Despite the reluctance of the military establishment, the Army Air Force was so desperate, they decided to bring women on as civilian pilots. They were civil servants, if you will. 
they would figure out a way to bring them into the military later as the bureaucratic details could be worked out. These pilots were the first women in America's history to fly American military aircraft. They flew non-combat missions in order to free men for combat. They flew over 60 million miles in as many as 75 different types of aircraft during the two years they were active. They flew the heaviest bombers, the fastest pursuit planes, and the lightest trainers. They were stationed at 120 Army air bases across the country. They ferried planes across the U.S. They they took meteorologists up for weather observations. They transported equipment, broken engines, and flew as couriers. They also helped to train gunners on the ground and in B-17s by towing targets behind their own planes. They test flew planes that had been repaired to make certain they were safe for the male cadets. One WASP even test flew America's first jet aircraft, the Bell YP-59A. On occasion, the WASPs were used as examples to prove to young male cadets that the feared B-26s and B-29s were safe to fly. The instructors would line up the fearful along the runway as these so-called flying coffins were landing. When a woman stepped out of the plane, a reluctant male pilot no longer had any excuses. They were shamefully told, see, even a girl can land this plane. So can you. Even though they were classified as civil servants, WASP had to conform to military regulations when on duty. They were entitled to the privileges of officers when on an army base and they had their own unique Santiago Blue uniforms. They went through the same training and work as the male Army Air Force pilots serving stateside and the women did the work with safer flying records and faster aircraft delivery times than the men. However, this semi-civilian, semi-military status was problematic. Granted, with a civilian status, they had some flexibility about their service. They could more easily resign, and some did. But for those that served, they were treated differently than the men. For example, they had to buy their own insurance. If they were injured, they were sent home to care for themselves. There were no death benefits, and not surprisingly, they were paid less money for doing virtually the same work. Of the 1,102 women who earned their silver wings, 38 of them were killed in service. When one of the women pilots was killed, the response of the Army Air Force depended on the commander at a particular base. Some pilots were honored with a service and escorted home by a fellow WASP at the government's expense. But sadly, many of the families received telegrams with the words, your daughter was killed this morning, where do you want the body? Often the families did not have the resources to bring the bodies home, so fellow WASP would take up collections to help with the expenses. Making it even more painful, the families of the 38 women killed were not allowed to put the same gold star in their windows as other families of fallen service members. Finally, in 1944, the Army Air Force decided it was time to militarize the WASP. Cap Arnold felt the program had been a success, and he wanted to bring the women in with full military status. General Arnold first testified before Congress in the spring of 1944, asking for the women to be formally made a part of the Army Air Force. While the general was activated, ag advocating for the women, simultaneously there was another group of pilots losing their jobs. Civilian male pilots who had served primarily as flight instructors were losing their draft deferments. The men had previously been offered positions in the military reserves and had turned them down, preferring to retain their civilian status. Despite the fact that these pilots had not gone through the same training, they clearly wanted the positions that the WASP held. Cap Arnold didn't want these civilian male pilots. In his opinion, they were untrained, inferior pilots, and he didn't need them. He had no problem with them being drafted into the regular military ranks. He preferred to keep his WASP ferrying the planes. But these civilian pilots were lobbying their members of Congress for support and at, at the expense of the WASP. The press took varying positions and editorials began appearing in the newspapers across the country. The WASP program was called everything from a blunder to a fast play. The story about Jackie Cochran's glamour girls taking the jobs of hardworking men caught the attention of Congress, so they formally voted down the bringing of WASP into the U.S. Army Air Force by just 19 votes, with 73 members abstaining. Congress had never said no to Hap Arnold before. Sadly, this time they did. On October 1st, 1944, the WASP were sent a letter that essentially said, 
Thank you for your service, but as of December 20th, we don't need you anymore. On December 20th, 1944, the WASP were unceremoniously deactivated with no honors, no benefits, and few thanks. Just as they had paid their own way to get to Sweetwater when disbanded, they had to pay their own way to get back home for wherever they were located. For example, Ag Carroll was in El Paso on December 20th. After deactivation, she found a job and worked briefly at an airplane factory in Tulsa. She then ferried a few planes from there to get back to Montana. Deactivation of the WASP was costly for both the war effort and the taxpayers. It deprived the Air Transport Command of expert pilots. It cost a million dollars to train men to do the women's jobs and it hampered the delivery of planes during the four to six months that these men were being trained. Women pilots had 18 months of experience, which could not be replaced. During that period, 55% of pursuit plane fairing in the U.S. had been done by the WASP. The WASP tried to feel proud that they had contributed to the war effort and to the women's place in aviation, but personally, their lives had just been shattered. To be sent home long before the war was over and just when they felt they were contributing of their skills the most was a devastating and bewildering blow. Flying had been their lives for over two years. There were no pilots anywhere in the Army Air Force more avid, enthusiastic, and certainly more grateful than the WASP. As the war ended, the women moved on with their lives. Some continued to fly or stay involved with aviation in some capacity. Many went back to college, but without the benefit of the GI Bill. Many married, had children, and became the backbone of their communities, volunteering in countless ways. While several, several worked as civil servant jobs, they did so without any veteran's preference for promotions. After the war, the U.S. Army Air Force was, the U.S. Air Force was recreated when it was separated from the U.S. Army. Over 200 of the WASP responded when they were invited to join the new Air Force Reserves, with some going to Korea and even Vietnam. That said, they were never allowed to fly military aircraft again. In the late 1960s, when the women in the reserves and the civil service were beginning to think about retirement, they began to realize that the two years they had spent flying for the U.S. Army Air Force during World War II were not being counted. They began to man, demand that those years be recognized. Then, in the early 1970s, the various military branches responding to the new Equal Rights Amendment announced that for the first time ever, women would be allowed to fly military aircraft. Surviving WASP were stunned to find that they had been forgotten. The WASP organized an extensive grassroots campaign by saying we were the first. They gained support from Hap Arnold's son Bruce and Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. Though Goldwater was one of a handful of senators who had voted against the ERA and opposed women in combat, he was one of the WASP's greatest advocates. He had flown with the WASP during the war and he felt they deserved to be called veterans. He and Louisiana Congresswoman Lindy Boggs fought to make it so. Finally, in November 1977, more than 30 years after their disbandment, President Carter signed the GI Improvement Act into law, which contained an amendment that officially declared that the WASP had served on active duty in the armed forces of the United States for purposes of laws administered by the Veterans Administration. The WASP were finally given the same benefit as other veterans. So here it is, March of 2010, and I'm going to Washington, D.C. to honor the Congress, to attend the Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony to honor the WASP. It has been more than two thirds of a century since these amazing women served our country and more than 33 years since they were given veteran status. The women who are actually able to make the journey are now in their 80s and 90s. Regardless of its delinquent timing, the event is exciting and I'm excited to attend. The festivities have been organized into a two-day event. Day one included an afternoon memorial service for the 38 women who had made the supreme sacrifice during the war. That was to be followed by an evening reception being hosted by American Airlines at the Women's Memorial at the Arlington National Cemetery. The actual presentation of the medal was to be made on day two at the Capitol. The memorial service even made the evening news. 
When old war pilots get together, somebody always calls it a gathering of eagles. Not today. This is a gathering of wasps. That's wasp as in women's Air Force service pilots, as in the first women to fly military aircraft. But they flew the B-17, the fortress. That's B-17 as in the plane that bombed Germany to its knees. The flying fortress. Dawn Seymour was one of 1,100 women who volunteered to fly during World War II. They never saw combat, but they flew just about every other kind of mission. I flew gunners on their training missions to learn how to fire the 50 caliber machine guns from a moving platform at a moving target. And now they are finally getting their moment in the sun. Ceremonies leading up to tomorrow's presentation of the Congressional Gold Medal for stepping forward at a desperate time. By 1942, we were in a tough spot in the war. Uh, we needed all the personnel that we could get flying. Air crews were flying into the teeth of German defenses and going down almost as fast as they could be trained. So you bring women in to do the job, just as we brought Rosie the Riveter in to work in the factories, uh, riveting the airplanes together. You bring women in to fly the planes so the men can go and fly combat overseas. Rosie the Riveter became a national icon while everyone forgot about the wasps, except women like Lieutenant Colonel Nicole Malakowski, who became the first female member of the Air Force Thunderbirds. When I made the decision to become an Air Force fighter pilot, a lot of people told me that's not something you can do, but I was able to look to the story of the wasp and realize that women can do it. The years have whittled them down to just a fragile few hundred. But talk to Dolores Lamb, and you know she had the right stuff. Oh, because I love to fly. And I was 18, and I just couldn't stand not being able to fly in a military airplane. But 38 of them were killed in crashes. Now we know who they were and what they did. David Martin, CBS News at the Air Force Memorial. As I pulled up in my cab at Arlington to attend the evening reception, a line was forming outside the Women's Memorial Building. A big tent was set up, so I queued up to get my security badge. I announced who I was, and a woman looked through the envelopes and handed me my registration materials. My aunt's name and the characters 43-W-5 were written on everything. I looked at my badge and asked the woman, what do these numbers mean? She looked at me like I was some kind of simpleton who had just asked Howard how to spell the word cat and replied, it was their class. I looked puzzled. Patiently, she explained the, explained the code. It represented my aunt's basic training class at Avenger Airfield in Sweetwater, Texas. The numbers meant that Aunt Carol had been in the fifth group of women trainees in 1943. It had never really occurred to me that my aunt had been part of a class of WASP. So now I knew, 43W5. While it wasn't the original class, it was certainly one of the early ones. As I entered the reception, the energy was palpable. There were people of all ages attending, wasps, their husbands, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and on and on. Many of the wasps had pulled their dress blue uniforms out of mothballs to wear to the festivities. Despite all the walkers, canes, and wheelchairs, the feeling of youth filled the room. I didn't know anyone there, so I watched, listened, and absorbed the joyous energy. Eventually, I walked into a smaller room that had been set up as a gift shop. For sale, there were some books about the wasps, so out of curiosity, I began thumbing through the indexes to see whether I could find any reference to Ann Carroll. Finally, I came across her name in a memoir that had been written by a wasp. I flipped to the indicated pages and read the following sentences. At Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas, there were barracks, six to a unit, a regular mess hall, a headquarters building, and even a complete infirmary. infirmary. There were also black widow spiders, tarantulas, and scorpions. One morning, we awoke to our first deaths. Two women pilots and an instructor lost on the night cross-country flight. We were never told exactly what happened. Perhaps no one knew. The plane had crashed and burned, or perhaps it was in the opposite order. The two women, Margaret Seip and Helen Severinsen, were best friends of Carol Jones in my barracks. Carol may have learned the details, but she did not talk about it, preferring to mourn in silence while she kept busy collecting together her friends' things to send to the families. The rest of us were saddened and sobered by their loss, by their absence. It forced us to look within and face our own mortality. 
I was stunned as I read these words. In all the years I had known Aunt Carol, she never told me any about anything about this. Perhaps it was one of the many tragedies of her life which she had learned to bury in the recesses of her heart. When they announced that the program was about to begin, I left the gift shop to hear what was being said. The CEO of American Airlines got up to welcome everyone and then embarrassingly relayed this company story. Shortly after the war, a WASP had applied to be a pilot for the airlines. After presenting her flight log, which recorded thousands of flight miles in all types of military planes, the director of HR at American Airlines told her, you clearly are the most experienced candidate, but sorry, we have to save these jobs for the men. Would you like to be a stewardess? This pilot's love of flying and planes were so profound, she actually accepted this condescending offer anything to stay close to her passion of flying. In a small way, this short story helped me to understand Aunt Carol's wanderlust and working around planes in the years after the WASP were so unceremoniously dismissed and disbanded. I stayed a bit longer at the reception then returned to my hotel. I left with little more knowledge about the WASP experience. In addition to learning what the numbers meant on my name tag, I had picked up a few catchphrases at the event. Phrases like the 38, which referred to the WASP who were killed in service. The next morning I arrived at the Capitol early. If the previous evening had been any indication, I knew there were gonna be big crowds and I wanted to get a decent seat for the ceremony. As I was standing there in the line, I began listening to the people around me. The woman in front of me was talking about her great aunt as being one of the 38. I wanted to hear what this woman had to say, so I interjected myself into the conversation. I learned that her great aunt, Gertrude Tompkins Silver, was different from the others. While 37 bodies had been recovered and sent home, Gertrude's body had never been found. She had taken off from California's Long Beach factory to begin ferrying a new plane to, to the East Coast for transport to Europe. Something was wrong with the plane and she disappeared. They were not exactly sure where her body was, but it assumed it was in the Pacific Ocean. Her great niece had come from Sacramento to attend the ceremony. She said to me, you know, I'm doing this for my grandmother. She never got over losing her sister. She would talk about her all the time. It was such a tragedy for our family. Eventually the line started to move as they opened the doors into the visitor center. The organizers had completely misjudged the size of the event. They had no idea that this would be the largest single gathering of people to show up for a congressional ceremony. To accommodate the crowds, the ceremony had to be moved to the newer visitor center, Emancipation Hall. After getting through security, I was seated in the family section. I looked over to the VIP section. There was Cokie Roberts with her mother, Lindy Boggs, the Congresswoman who in 1977 had worked with Senator Goldwater to get the WASP veterans benefits. And also sitting there in the VIP section was former Attorney General Janet Reno. If she hadn't been in the VIP section, I was tempted to go over and introduce myself. Her darling aunt was Winifred Wood, one of Aunt Carol's great friends. Suds and Wynn would wistfully swap stories about their two nieces, Janie and Annie, who had made it big in a man's world and if only they'd been born a little bit later. As the ceremony started, in marched a color guard, all dressed up in colonial attire, looking like that John Trumbull painting of the fife and drum. Following behind them were Harry Reid, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, and John Boehner. There were a lot of speakers praising the WASP. Their themes were about the same, telling the story of some remarkable WASP from California or Nevada or Kentucky or Ohio. Because of its timing, less than 300 of the WASP were still alive and only about 100 had been able to make the trip. The rest were either too frail or too far away. Then Tom Brokaw spoke. He was wonderful. He had written about the WASP in his books, so his comments were heartfelt and genuine. His speech also drew the biggest applause and the most laughter when he said, I have another reason to say this is the greatest generation. You have done something unique in the nation's capital this year. You have brought to a common hall, a common cause, a common microphone, and a common language, Senators Reed and McConnell, Speaker Pelosi, and Congressman Boehner. But what I really love listening to, who I really love listening to was Nicole Malkowski, the White House fellow who had worked tirelessly to see that the WASP were honored with this medal. 
As the first female Thunderbird pilot, Colonel Malakowski loved the Wasp. She shared a memorable story about how she had landed her first Thunderbird air show. And there along the fence were these older gray-haired women cheering her on and standing in line to shake her hand and meet her. To her, the Wasp were truly the wind beneath her wings. Finally, the presentation of the medal was made. Deanie Parrish accepted the award on behalf of all the Wasps. I listened and absorbed her acceptance speech. I'd like to quote some of it. <clears throat> with humility and a great sense of pride, 65 years ago, we each served our country without any expectations of recognition or glory. We did it without compromising the values that we were taught as we grew up. Honor, integrity, patriotism, service, faith, and commitment. We did it because our country needed us. We thank you for passing this bill to honor our service. As I look around this room and see the cameras, all of the news people that are covering this event, we want to especially thank you, each of you, because whether or not you realize it, you are educating millions of people all over America who have never heard of the WASP. And that is all, all we ever ask for is that our all overlooked, looked, overlooked history would someday no longer be a missing chapter in the history of World War II, the history of the Air Force, the history of aviation, and most especially the history of America. I believe that I speak for everyone when I say that it was both a privilege and an honor to serve our country during some of the darkest days of World War II. The ceremony ended, the speakers cleared the stage, and the colored guard left. I went to sand in one last line to pick up Aunt Carol's medal. As I was returning to the airport, I reflected on the previous few days in awe of my aunt and her flying sisters. I was so energized and wanted to tell the wasp story to anyone who would listen. But this experience also showed me how little I really knew about the wasp story. Who were these women? I had skimmed a few of the papers and books that Aunt Carol had sent me along the way. But to me, planes were just planes. So the material never really grabbed my attention. I had met Dot and Wynne and Mary and other of Aunt Carol's wasp friends. But to be honest, when I was around them, it was like sitting at a cafe in Paris. Interesting to watch, but not understanding a word of what they were talking about. They spoke in a foreign language about places like Sweetwater and Camp Davis, about B-17s and towing targets and things I clearly did not understand. And sadly, I found a bit boring. As I was leaving Washington, I was kicking myself. Why didn't I listen more carefully and ask more questions? What a lost opportunity to learn about a time in their lives when everything was so raw and so exciting. But now curiosity took hold. I was so inspired by this Congressional Gold Medal experience that I began digging in and reading as much as I could find. I read countless memoirs and biographies as well as nonfiction books about women's aviation and historic aviators. And I learned quite a bit I was surprised to discover that initially there were two women pilot programs within the Army Air Force, the WAFs, or the Women's Auxiliary Fly Fairing Squadron, and the WFTD, or the Women's Flying Training Detachment. Both were initiated in the fall of 1942. The WAFs, or the Women's Auxiliary Fairing Squadron, were called the Originals. These 28 experienced pilots were recruited by Nancy Harkness Love, to fly for the Air Transport Command, or the ATC. The WASPs were some of America's most experienced young pilots, male or female, with an average of nearly 1,200 flight hours between them. Some of these women pilots even owned flying schools and airports, yet they had to endure the many indignities of being the first to join the Army Air Force. When they arrived at the Newcastle Army Air Base headquarters in Delaware, the ATC was six weeks behind on its deliveries of new aircraft from factories to the American um, air service bases. Coming to Newcastle at their own expense to offer their flying skills to the U.S. Army Air Force, these women were treated like novices. When one pilot showed her logbook of over 2,000 hours to her check pilot, he looked at it critically and said, I can always tell once I see how a girl flies whether or not she's padded her logbook. Ferrying the planes from one coast to the other was an exhausting job. The pilots would fly across the country and then deliver the plane at its destination. Sometimes they were able to find a plane ride back to their base, but more often they would have to get on a train and sit in coach 
make the same journey in reverse. Then they would start the fairing process all over again. The WFTD, or the Women's Flying Training Detachment, was started by Jackie Cochran at the Municipal Airport in Houston. That location turned out to be problematic, so they relocated to a remote air base, Avenger Field, in Sweetwater, Texas. Aunt Carol's class was the first group to begin training in Sweetwater. Nancy Love and Jackie Cochran had different visions. Nancy wanted a small, elite group of professional pilots to test and ferry planes. Jackie envisioned the women pilots as a major arm within the Army Air Force. She sought out any stateside pilot activity that a woman pilot could perform so as to free male pilots for combat. These two women pilot programs and their respective leaders operated independently and without acknowledging each other until the summer of 1943 when Jackie Cochran pushed aggressively for a single entity so she could control the activity of all the women pilots. When the two groups were merged, the name was changed to the WASP, and Nancy Love was assigned to be the person in charge of WASP bearing operations and ended up reporting to Jackie. The two women could not have been more dissimilar, so they always had an uneasy, albeit professional, relationship. The originals were considered the creme de la creme of pilots. They were revered by future WASP for their skills and experience. These originals were devoted to Nancy Love and never really quite accepted Jackie Cochran as their new leader. I learned about the many experiences of those pilots like Ann Carroll who were directly recruited by Jackie Cochran. They went to Avenger Field to go through the same training that was given to aviation cadets. Just like the men, they marched, did calisthenics, and were saluted by enlisted personnel. They were disciplined and earned demerits. Many of the male instructors wanted, were unhappy with the situation and wanted the women to wash out so their training could be tough and very discouraging. A recurring theme in every memoir was about the Spartan conditions and the intense discipline of this WASP flight training in the hot, dusty, and snake-infested air base of Avenger Field in Sweetwater. One humorous aspect of this all-female training base Male pilots would request emergency landings so they could check out Avenger Field to actually see of these women pilots and possibly look for a date. On one day, 40 pilots did that, so the Army forbid their planes to land there. As a result, Avenger Field became known as Cochran's Convent. There was a collegiality and pride of each class at Sweetwater with yearbooks, class songs, and other talismans of a sorority-like setting. These women would study aerodynamics and meteorology, but would also make curtains for the bays in their barracks. They would sweep snakes off the runway before they would take off, but then they would, when they landed, they made sure to put on their lipstick and comb their hair before they climbed out of their planes. I learned about the wasp emblem or mascot, the gremlin, Fifinella. She was the cute Disney cartoon character who was always ready to take on the flying challenge. Not surprisingly, years later, to honor the wasp, Colonel Malakowski chose Fifi to be your call sign. Just look at this newsreel to get a sense of the atmosphere and the attitudes that existed about these girl pilots. One can tell that this is a pretty stage because of their attire. They never dress quite so formally in the cockpits. Whoops, sorry, let me go back. There we go. In these PT-19s, they learn the Army way. Though each girl is a pilot when she comes, she must adjust herself to a new technique, and hairdos are sacrificed. Nothing goes on or up unrecorded by the tower watch. The girls have the identical type used by the cadets at Randolph Field. Mass training proves the girls to be superior at instrument flight, but not men's equal in reaction to emergencies. Their emblem is called a Fipinel, the gremlin's little sister. Always trust a Fipinel, they say. And every girl an American champion in the staggering job of eclipsing the sun with our wings and burying our foes with our bombs. Isn't she a beauty? Oh, you said it, brother. And brains, too. It takes brains to read these instruments. Climb out for the daily sun bath, storing up energy against the grueling training of minds and bodies, 
for the tremendous responsibilities that lie ahead. Six American beauties, 12 for well, there's a pilot and co-pilot in each, and ever more girls applying at Avenger Field, eager to fly for Uncle Sam, eager to win the wings and assume the duties for which women were once deemed unfit. Unfit? Oh, physical standards as rigid as for their brothers at Randolph Field. Graduates now, they're members of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, fearless as Falcons and twice as fast. And in their new and unusual occupation, these modern girls are still the feminine heirs to a noble tradition of pioneering strength and courage. Off they go to be conveyed to other ferry stations or to factories in the continental United States in order that they may deliver new fighter and trainer planes to masculine fighting hands. Stronger hands, perhaps, but no more valiant than those of their sisters, the Wasps. I came to appreciate the blatant, overt, and even dangerous sexism the WASP experienced while working within the very macho Army Air Force. Some of the men understandably felt threatened that the WASP were taking over their stateside jobs, thus sending them into combat. Although it was never documented early in the WASP program, there were rumors of sabotage in one or two of the crashes. One of the more controversial assignments was target towing at Camp Davis in North Carolina. When the first group of WASP arrived, they were working under the command of Colonel Lovick Stevenson. As one pilot recalled, Colonel Stevenson left no question as to what he thought about women in the military, especially as pilots. At first, he was paternalistic, advising us to go home and knit socks for the troops. Reluctantly, Stevenson had to obey orders, but he didn't like it, which made the situation pretty challenging for the WASP stationed at Camp Davis. Try to imagine the risk the WASP face as they tow targets behind these obsolete and unsound aircraft. Can you see this tow right here? Um, while soldiers who were being trained gunnery maneuvers would be shooting live ammunition at them. Just to give you a sense of how dangerous this was, let me share with you one story. 26-year-old Mabel Rawlinson was learning night flying for towing targets in the A-24 aircraft when she crashed in a swamp at the edge of the runway at Camp Davis on August 23rd in 1943. Mechanical problems had forced the plane down. It hit the ground and split in two. Mabel was unable to open the canopy and was trapped in the front of the plane as it went up in flames. The A-24s they were using for tow targeting were worn out from war duty and were difficult to maintain. Many of the planes had been returned from the South Pacific because they were no longer fit for combat. For Mabel's plane, the repair record noted that the canopy latch needed fixing but hadn't been repaired. Yet the official report of her death, there was no mention of the faulty latch. It was not unusual for the investigators to classify any WASP crash as pilot error. Through my research about the WASP experience, I learned a lot about the driven and controversial Jackie Cochran. A competitive woman, Jackie ignored the niceties, politics, and protocols of both Washington and the U.S. military establishment. One could even argue that a contributing factor to the demise of the, her beloved WASP organization was her ruthless determination to maintain complete control over it. I learned about their zoot suits, their first solo and night flights, the fact that the WASP were the creators of the so-called Mile High Club, as well as countless other memorable details about the WASP experience. Granted, with every book, I had to slog through what I considered the boring parts. I simply do not share the pilot fascination with airplanes. Regardless, I have found the WASP story fascinating, not because of their achievements or even the WASP experience, but because of their individual stories. Over 25,000 women applied to become a WASP. About 1,700 women were accepted, but only about 1,100 made it through the training to get their silver wings. I've told you the story about Suds and some of her friends, but there are 1,100 other stories. Among these women were wives and widows of servicemen. Some were mothers, others were single. There was a golf pro and a Broadway actress. There were debutantes, doctors, models, students, and corporate and political heiresses. One of the flying Hutchinsons, a celebrated family that had flown around the world in the 1930s. But most were simply adventuresome young women who saw the boys next door going off to war 
with great fanfare and they wanted to go too. While some wanted an adventure or perhaps an escape from the tediousness of their daily lives, all wanted to serve their country and all just wanted to fly. They simply loved flying. I could go on and on about the personal stories of the WASP. For example, I know I could do a whole program on the brash, mercurial, and contentious Jackie Cochran, the first woman pilot to both win the Bendix air race and to break the sound barrier. Or another lecture about the lovely, refined pilot's pilot, Nancy Harkness Love, the woman who started it all with the Woman's Auxiliary Fairing Squadron and was eventually to become the first woman to secretly fly the hump over the treacherous air route of the Himalayas. Another great story is about one of the originals, Cornelia Fort, the debutante from Nashville, who was one of the few pilots to witness from the air and survive the attack on Pearl Harbor, only to become the first of the 38 when the less experienced reckless male pilot flew too close to her plane and sheared her wing. Their stories were absolutely amazing, but as you can see, there's just so much material and not enough time. My hope is that your curiosity will take you to learn more about these women, as well as their experiences being part of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots of World War II, so you can talk about them with your children and grandchildren. Perhaps then the story of the WASP will no longer be a missing chapter in the history of World War II, the history of the Air Force, the history of aviation, and most especially, the history of America. Let me end this talk by sharing the words of a few of these remarkable women. They can look at us and they can hear the words coming from us. Go for it. Because that's what we did. We went for it. What we did was very hush hush. No one knew. I couldn't even tell Mother and Daddy what I was doing. We realize there's danger, a danger in anything that you attempt, but um, there, there was that camaraderie about the love of flying that, that drew us together. When Pearl Harbor hit, my dad flew out of that house so fast, he was the second man in line down at the recruiting station, and he was glorious because he was two years too old. So, you know, it was up to me. I'm so glad I was born. In the time I was born, we had no toys, but we worked our minds and made toys. We didn't even have an alarm clock. The old jackass across the street bade every morning we got up. Ever since I can remember, every time I went to walk out of the house, no matter where I was going, my dad would look up, look me in the eye and say, now remember, young lady, honor is your first consideration. Dropped out of college, and dad said, well, I'll pay for college, but I'm not planning for any flying lessons. So I went to work, <laughs> paid for my own flying lessons. And I noticed this flagpole and flag out in her yard. And I thought, well, Mom, what's that for? Well, she said, everybody who has somebody in service is supposed to fly a flag, and that's mine. Before I get out of an airplane, I take my comb on my little pocket, I take my lipstick, I take my head off, I brush up my hair because I'm a woman pilot. I just want my grandchildren to be mighty in spirit. That's a better word, mighty in spirit, than to be able to stand alone. Because love has no, no boundaries and no frontiers. You can trust the world. You can love somebody on the other side of the world. Dear God, be good to me. The sea is so wide. And my boat is so small. It isn't too late. We still want to tell our tale that you can do anything in this world you make up your mind to do. And that won't change. That didn't change in the 20s or the 30s, and it hasn't changed in the 90s, and it won't change in the 2000s. It's still up to you to make up your mind what you want to do and do it. Do not uh, undervalue your ability. You have ability that you haven't had a chance to use. Now find something you want to use it on and then get after it. Put God first, family next, and then whatever you want to do, whatever's needed. I think that's important for young people today to realize that there were people before them who did things that were, were dangerous. But in order for this country to be free, that's what it took. And they did it without question. Well, it was a rare group at a rare time that had something to offer and offered it, even if it meant they were offering lives. 
is that important? I think I can speak for all the wives when I say there's no greater thrill than really, than to be able to serve your country by doing something you love to do. go all right thank you so much that was amazing um all right so we've got some questions great uh, first one is between 1977 when the wasp received vet vet, vet benefits and 2010 when they received official recognition it was 33 years who pushed for the recognition during these years and why is there not a full motion picture on this those are really two good questions um I think that there was always some people pushing, but it wasn't until Mikhail, uh, Nicole Malakowski became a White House fellow. Um, she was that Thunderbird pilot that you saw on that newsreel. I don't know if you remember her. Um, she loved the WASP. I mean, she just, she was the one who really pushed for the recognition. The people that got the Congressional Gold Medal um, in Congress were, um, the sponsors were Barbara Mikulski from the senator from um, Maryland, and then Kay Bailey Hutchinson, the senator from Texas. They were the ones that actually got the legislation through. And then I'm sorry, but I can't remember the names of the two Congress. But it was all women that pushed it through. It wasn't. I'm sure that's why it happened. They were. I mean, if you could have seen some of the people that got the congressional gold medal long before they did, um, like people like I don't know. Mickey Mantle, or I can't remember some of the names, but yeah. but it was it was it they they were late in coming, and then the second question part of the second part of the question was I forget. Um, oh, why isn't there a full a, a motion picture? Oh, well, that is actually a really good story. Um, I sat next to just coincidentally when I was at the ceremony, I sat next to a fellow who was a producer for Disney, and he was there representing his aunt, so we were both there representing our aunt, and he said. Um, um, I asked him, I said, how come you haven't made a movie about this? And he said, he said, it's really hard to get something like this made. He said, when they did Amelia, the movie with uh, Hilary Swank, I don't know if you remember that movie, it was such a bomb that they were not very open to doing something um, like this. And I said, I remember saying to him, I said, but that's not a very interesting story. She just disappeared. I said, this, this, this could be a whole TV series. And he says, I know, I know. He says, it's just really hard to get something like this made because there doesn't seem to be enough interest for it. So if you think it'd be a great movie, send out your, I, I actually, I have to tell you, it's kind of funny. I, after I got back, I was pretty motivated. So I sent Steven Spielberg a letter telling him he ought to make a movie out of this. And I got the letter back saying, we don't accept things from strangers. So <laughs> anyway, I still think it's a great idea for a movie. Um, okay, another question was, were the benefits retroactive? To the best of my ability, I, I don't think so. I think they just went, I think they just went forward. So, for example, they didn't obviously get the GI benefit. They didn't get um, they didn't get any of the things that the servicemen after the war got. But after going forward, they were able to get veterans' health care and things like that. Mm -hmm. But the thing that was really interesting is they were never considered um, part of the army. They were only they were only, the way the law was written. They were only eligible for veterans' benefits. Basically, like they had not been assigned a division. Exactly. And so what happened was, then there became the big question about Arlington. And they were denied burial at Arlington. And that became a whole big brouhaha in about um, six or seven years ago. And they finally had to pass legislation to allow them to be buried at Arlington, because a number of them wanted to be. And, and are there any actually at Arlington now? Yes, there are. There are. There are a few. Um, I don't know who is, and I don't know the number, but there are a few. All right, Jerry Schneider recommends sending the idea to Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks, okay. I'll send the idea to Tom Hanks. He'll probably come back saying we don't accept. Right, unsolicited but, ideas. Unsolicited ideas. The, uh, so Any other questions? There were, yeah, there there were um, there are a couple museums, small museums, one in Sweetwater, um, and then one at one, one in uh, Denton, and I th I think it's women's. Texas Women's College is in Denton, Texas, yeah. which is near Dallas. They have all the archival material and the papers there, like my aunt's papers are there. And then there's a little women's museum in um, Sweetwater, 
so both of those things are on my bucket list. I sort of want to go down and see those things. I haven't been there. Um, and Alex, you're going to send out some of the bibliography of some of the materials that I, so you can, you can, there's one of my favorite things. Well, there's a number of things I like, but one that I really liked was that the American experience on PBS has a um, segment called fly girls that, that was probably done. I don't know, 15 years ago. So you can, you can probably get that on PBS or, and if you go to the PBS, um, uh, website. They also have different stories and vignettes about them. And it, if you just do even a Google search, you'll get tons of stuff. And then there's this major organization called Wings Across America, and they've got a lot of information out there as well. Hmm. Excellent. All right. So um, for the audience, if you're interested, you can type um, a question in the chat at the bottom of the um, page. If you just hover, you'll get a little button that pops up that says chat and you can put a question there if you like. And you began this research before your aunt passed away, correct? She, My she, aunt passed away in 2009 and prior to her death, um, she would send me things periodically. And I would sort of put them off to the side and not really look at them because it really, to be honest, it just didn't interest me that much. Mm -hmm. And then um, she died in 2009, and then the Congressional Gold Ceremony was in 2010. And I went thinking I knew something about this because I knew more than most people did. And I realized when I got there, I knew nothing about it. I mean, I really, every day was kind of an, a learning experience for me. Um, and I, I, I came back just incredibly, well, proud and in awe of these people. I mean, they did something really quite remarkable if you think about it. And that's why I got really interested. And I, like I said in the story, I was really angry at myself that I didn't ask more questions while my aunt was alive or when I could have talked with Wynn or, you know, Dot or Mary or any of these women that I met. Like I said, though, they did talk in a, in a private language. I mean, it was a, it was a very intense experience in their lives and they were connected for life because of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the questions is, um, do you have any um, statistics on how WASPs may have helped pave the way for women to be culturally accepted in the airline industry? I know that you said that the American airline um, CEO actually acknowledged the fact that they had not done right by one of the WASPs by making her a stewardess instead of a pilot. I don't know that uh, they did much of anything, to be honest. Um, I never came across any material along that way. What I would say, my understanding was that the original flight attendants in commercial airlining were nurses. They weren't pilots. They were, they, they saw this in case somebody got sick on the plane, they wanted to have a nurse there to take mm -hmm. care of them. So the initial flight attendants were actually registered nurses. Um, women didn't start flying airplanes. When do you think, Carol, they may be in the 1980s? I don't remember them flying. No, much I think that I think some of the first airline pilots are actually um, in the seventies. I think that they were able to log enough hours in Vietnam, even though they weren't actually flying combat. Um, because one of my best friends actually um, became a pilot um, in 1978, and um, and she that and commercial I, airlines. She moved eventually to commercial airlines. She actually was a rocket scientist and um, probably one of the smartest women I know. She now runs her own training school um, somewhere in Nevada. But um, by then I know that there had been some women breaking through, but it wasn't very many. Um, but they, th at that point- well, they, they don't think, I don't think they were on the big ones either. I don't think they were right. like on United or American. I think they were on little- Right, exactly. Little, little regional, regional um, airlines and things yeah. like that before they were accepted into the big thing. I mean. To, just to get into the training program to learn the 707s or the 737 was pretty late in coming, I'm pretty sure. And I still think that statistically, and again, Christine, I apologize that we don't have the exact numbers, but I still think statistically they're a very small minority of the number of pilots that fly. I mean, I think that it has been pretty much a boys club all along. Right. All right, any other questions? All right, it is a little after eight. Anne, thank you so much. This was magnificent. And oh, I hope everybody enjoyed it.
Yeah, for those of you who attended, thank you so much. We're really pleased that we're able to pull this many people into the programs that we do. And we you know, appreciate any support you can provide us to continue to provide these programs at only suggested donations. So from the History Center, we thank you for attending. Bye -bye. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Happy, happy flying, as they say. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> right.